when my wife, Andrea, and I bought our first house, it was in um, Gardner, Kansas, a little town uh, outside of Kansas City where we were planting a church. And um, the house that we had lived in before actually was the church's parsonage when we were pastoring in Philadelphia. So this was our first house. It was a small house, but the thing that stood out to me the most was how ratty the yard was. And, it, and I th- one of the reasons it just stood out is because I'm a lawn guy. I like lawns that look sweet. And right next to me was a, a, a person that had a, or a family that had a beautiful lawn. And then on the other side of me was another family that had a beautiful lawn. And I'm like, oh, man, makes the yard even looks worse. So uh, the guy next to me was a name, guy named Mark, Mark and Patty. So I went over and I introduced myself. I said, hey, I'm, the, I'm your new neighbor with the ratty yard. <laughs> your yard looks awesome. And so you can do that in Kansas. You can just introduce yourself like that. It works. And um, so we, this guy, Mark, and I just kind of struck a friendship. And he became like my, my lawn mentor because my dad, you know, growing up, he wasn't into lawns. And our lawn didn't look that great growing up. It just wasn't important to us. But I wanted, you know, this house to have a cool yard. So I said to Mark, man, how, how did you get your yard so nice? He goes, well, I tried, you know, planting seed, didn't work. Basically, I boiled down to just sodding it. I know it's kind of expensive, but if, if in Kansas, it's hard to grow grass. You, you just got to sod the thing. I'm like, okay. So I went down to the, you know, the garden store, and I couldn't believe how expensive sod is. I'm a young man, you know, and we, we were planting at church. We didn't have any money. So instead of sodding the whole yard, I just sodded the front yard. It's not a, not a very big yard. Just sodded the front yard because everybody can see that. And um, it just looked so good. I'm like, hey, Mark, we're, you know, we're a team. This is awesome. But after a couple months, my, there's this, like these parts of the lawn that started looking old and ratty again. I'm like, what, what happened? I, you know, I prepared the soil. You know, I got rid of all the, you know, the gravel that was kind of on top. And, and uh, you know, this, this should be working. I was watering it. So I just watered some more. And, and the areas that were patchy just got worse and worse and basically died. And so I said, Mark, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? He goes, oh, did you put fertilizer on it? I'm like, no, I, did, I didn't. So just get some fertilizer. So we put some fertilizer on it. And it made the, the rest of the yard look really good, but the nasty ratty parts just looked worse and worse. See, nothing was helping. So I'm like, okay, um, I need to go beyond Mark because Mark doesn't really have the, the, the magic wand here for my yard. And uh, again, you know, I'm motivated to have a nice yard. So I talked to this guy at our church, and he goes, well, what kind of fertilizer did you put on? You can ruin a yard by putting the wrong fertilizer. And I'm like, I don't know. Fertilizer is fertilizer. He's like, no, fertilizer is not fertilizer. What did you do? And I'm like, I don't know. I, he goes, you need to just hire a lawn service. And I'm like, I can't afford to do that. So, you know, the year went by. He's this, you know, let it sit. It'll get better. It's a new lawn. So the next year, it looked worse. And I, I know what people are thinking because we moved from Philadelphia. They're like, city boy, he can't even grow grass. And all, all around us are farms where people are growing crops and stuff. And I'm like, you know, even though I know what you're thinking about me, I'm not a city boy. I only lived there three years. I'm a farm boy. But just because you're a farm boy doesn't mean you know how to grow grass. And so um, I was talking to a guy, in a ch- another guy in the church, and I'm like, you know, I don't know what to do about this. I just feel like I need to you know, do something bigger. He goes, no, you don't need something bigger. You just need, let me come over. I'll take a look at your yard. I found out Randy, this is the guy's name, was actually a lawn guy. That's what he did for a living. And he looks at my yard and he goes, okay, it's time for us to take, you know, you've done all these things. Good way to go. You didn't ruin it with the fertilizer. You know, your sod should be taking and, you know, you raked it up and everything. It's time we took a deeper look. And I'm like, ooh, deep. Time to take a deeper look. So I actually love that phrase, it's time to take a deeper look. So I named this sermon after Randy's language because it turned out to be the greatest thing I could do for my yard, and it might be the greatest thing that we could do in your life. Because watch how this goes together. I got to the point, actually, it was a three-year process because I also tried to grow grass seed in the back, and just after I seeded it and put straw on it. The worst rainstorm that Kansas had had in 50 years washed all my seed away. And about a month later, my farmer in the backyard, back uh, plot had a beautiful stand of grass from my grass seed. Um, And I tried to, you know, I thought about digging it up and planting my own sod there, but no. I, I just went through all this stuff and I got to the point where I'm like, you know what, maybe 
maybe I'm just one of these horticulturally, did I say that right? Horticulturally challenged guys. Maybe I can't grow a simple, you know, yard. And this is over the years, I've just heard other people say it, not about their yard, but about their spiritual life. Maybe I just can't grow a spiritual life. Maybe spiritual depth, spiritual growth is not just the thing. You know, it's for pastors, it's for board members, it's for Sunday school teachers, it's for special people, but maybe it's just not for me. I've actually heard people say, I've tried everything. I've you know, gone to church, I've read my Bible, I've gone to Bible studies, I've been in groups, I've fasted and prayed, I've gone to seminars, I've gone down to the altar and I prayed and I cried. You know, I've done all these things to try to grow myself spiritually and maybe I'm just not one of those people that can grow a, a, a deep, rich, spiritual life. Now, I don't know if that's the way you feel. Maybe you've just kind of given up on it altogether and you're like, well, it's just not important to me. Or maybe you're here frustrated because you do want a deep and flourishing life. You want to harvest like we talked about last week. You look at other people and you're like, man, her life seems to go so well. When she reads the Bible, when he reads the Bible, it's like it, it opens up to them. And you, if you can do this, you envy with Christian envy, <laughs> because envy is a sin. You envy with Christian envy their walk with God and their understanding of the word. And so if that's you, or if you've just given up, I want to invite you to a story that Jesus told that basically is him taking a deeper look into people's spiritual growth. So turn with me to Luke chapter 8. This is where we were last week. And we're in this excursion, this extended series, where we're taking an in-depth look. And we introduced this last week, but I still want to read the scripture again. So if you'll stand with me, we'll read Luke 8, 4 through 15. Actually, I'm only going to read, you know, like 4 to uh, 8, and then I'll pick it up later. But here we go, Luke chapter 8, verse 4, while a large crowd was gathering, and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer, this fits a good Kansas story, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, it was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Remember that, they had no moisture. Other seeds, so this is our third kind of setting, other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked out the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil and came up, and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. And when he said this, he called out, he cried out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And then we'll skip down now to verse 11. So Jesus says, I'm going to explain the parable now. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. So this is the sower is sowing the seed. Those along the path are the ones who hear the word of God. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts. We talked about that last week. Those, um, so that they takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground, that's the one we're going to look at today, are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. Third soil, the seed that fell among thorns, stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Okay, you may be seated. Did you, did you notice that verses 5 to 8, Jesus tells the parable, and then in verses 11 to 15, he explains it. He doesn't do this very often. Tell us a story and then explain it, but he does in great detail here. And if you missed the seed that the sower is planting in the parable, that's the, that's the sower, that's the preacher 
That's Jesus in this story, and it's me today who's sowing, who's preaching, who's sowing the word of God into the soil, which is our hearts. And then he talks about four different kinds of soil. Last week was the hard soil or the hard heart. This week, the rocky soil, the rocky heart. Next week, the thorny soil, and then the good soil. And as I asked you um, last week, as you hear each one of these uh, illustrations of the soil and the heart, ask yourself, today, as the seed of the word of God is being sown, that's, this is a picture Jesus is painting. As I'm preaching the word, as I'm teaching the word, ask yourself, what is the condition of the soil of my heart, right? What is the condition of my heart? Is it a hard heart? Is it a rocky heart? I'm not even sure what that means yet. Is it a thorny heart or is it a good fertile heart? And so since we're gonna focus in on the rocky soil, that's two verses. That's verse six. Some fell on rocky ground and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. And then where Jesus explains it, verse 13, those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy which sounds so good, when they hear it, each one of the soils hears, each one of the people hears the word, but they have no root. And so they believe for a while, but the time, in the time of testing, they fall away. So what we're gonna do, if you've got your notes there, I got a lot of stuff to say. What we're gonna do is start off by just reminding ourselves of how um, spiritual growth works. We're gonna take a deeper look at how spiritual growth works. And it's real simple. The process is just like in nature, you have the seed that lands on the soil, it gets watered, the sun shines, the roots go down, growth happens and eventually fruit gets born. So in the spiritual realm, it's the same thing. The seed is the word of God, Jesus said. The soil is our hearts. So the word is sown as I'm preaching today, it's being sown into your hearts and the roots is faith. As you hear the word, as you embrace the word, as it sinks down into your heart, faith is born, right? Faith is born from the hearing of the word. And as you hear that word and as you receive it, it, faith begins to develop and faith produces this spiritual growth and that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You can see how these line up almost absolutely perfectly. And this is why Jesus is telling the story. And the, the problem with this second soil is that it has no root, roots can't go down, therefore there's no fruit that is born and therefore there's no harvest. Now, uh, I'd love for you to go back and hear last week's sermon because it sets up this whole series, but let me review something that's very important from last week that I'll do each week. And that is we talked about the secret to spiritual growth is learning how to hear God's word. Because Jesus uses the word hear all four times, all four soils, all four people's hearts, each one of them hear the word, hear the word, hear the word, all four of them hear. But it only produces a harvest in one, remember? Only one. So we discovered what every parent knows, that you can hear but not hear. And this is not something that Jesus introduces. This is actually a concept that's picked up from the Old Testament that there's a way of hearing from, God's, from, from, from God that, that roots into our heart, that changes our lives. And this is why Jesus, just a couple verses later, says in Luke 8, 18, therefore, consider carefully how you hear. Not that you hear. This is not consider carefully that you hear. Jesus knows that. The seed is being sown. He knows that people are hearing, just like today, in all of our campuses, all of you are hearing, small h-e-a-r, but are you hearing biblically? That's, that's why I'm creating this acronym, and that's where it, it comes from these verses in the story that keep talking about hearing, okay? So each week, we're gonna build on this. Last week, we saw how Jesus's little brother, Remember this? James wrote a letter and kind of used the same agrarian picture, the same picture of horticulture, and talked about how we want to humbly accept the word planted in us. He got that image from Jesus. 
as the word is being preached, as you're reading it, as you're hearing it taught, humbly accept the word planted in your heart and in your soil, the soil of your heart. And so we got our H right from this verse here. And we talked about last week, the first step in hearing biblically, the first step in hearing God's way in a way that bears fruit is to humbly open ourselves, to, to prepare our hearts by being humble to the preaching of the word, by opening ourselves. Instead of coming hard, resistant, the arms crossed spiritually. You can cross your arms physically, it's okay. But you know, just kind of a resistant attitude. I come open, I come humble. And we need to be reminded from time to time to come to the word of God humble. Sometimes we, we have a hardness of heart and a resistance that keeps us from hearing what God has to say. Then there's sometimes when we feel like we know this passage so well that we're like, yeah, I understand it. And that's not humility. That's like, I already understand this, Jim. I already get this. I don't need another sermon on this. I get it. That's not humility. So whether you have known the Bible for all your whole life or whether you're hearing it preached for the you know, earliest times, come to the word, come listening, come reading with a humble openness. Amen? So that, that was last week. I told you last week that we would then move to the next word, the word accept, you know, later on the series. Well, here it is, later on the series. And this phrase, accept the word, is the exact same three Greek words as our verse 13, receive the word. And in fact, this phrase, uh, it's dekomai tan lagon. It, 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 it happens three or four different times in the scriptures, but it's fascinating to me that it's the same, uh, just different tenses, but it's the same three Greek words. So there's something similar going on here. It's this idea of the people who receive the word with joy when they hear it. Are they humbly accepting the word planted in? That's the question. So we've taken a deeper look at how spiritual growth happens. Let's now take a deeper look in how we receive the word. Here is the key that will determine whether you have a rocky heart that does not produce a harvest or whether you have a good and fertile heart. And as we go deeper, take a deeper look into this idea of what does it mean to receive the word, Jesus' words, as we compare them with other places in Scripture, will help open this up for us. So here's these two verses we're looking at. Luke 8, 13 the second kind of soil, the second kind of people, the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it. And then this command that James gives us to receive the word, accept the word. And you can put the word acceptance right here. This is our second set of words in our HEAR acronym. It's humbly accepting the word. Now you say, well, Jim, being humbly open is real similar to accepting the word. There's a little similarity there, but there's something else going on in the idea of receiving the word of God, accepting it into our hearts and our lives that I wanna show you from the book of Acts. I know the, the guys all preach from the book of Acts this summer, but let me show you something that's so cool. And I, I wasn't here, so I don't know whether they made a big deal out of this, but it's another example of the same three words in the Greek, receive the word, accept the word. And this is in Acts chapter 17. You don't need to turn there because it's just going to be here a really short time. Acts 17, Paul the apostle is preaching the word in Greece, and he comes to this area called Berea, which whenever we go on our Greece trips, we go there. And Luke, the guy who's writing this story, says that when the people in the town of Berea heard Paul preach, they received the word. It's the exact same three words. It's so cool. Again, tense is a little bit different, but same three Greek words. They received the word, and then look at that phrase, with all eagerness. That's the key, because that's gonna be our word here, to humbly open ourselves when we hear the word and to have an eager acceptance to it. Now, I said that there is something else going deeper than just humbly being open. Let me kind of watch me for a second. The humble openness is like this. I've opened up my life. I open up my heart. I'm opening up my mind. I come to church with a humble openness to hear the word. I, I open the Bible in the morning 
with a humble openness. I go to uh, a teaching when I go to a class, or, or you know, and I'm, I'm humbly opening my life. I want to keep that over there. I want to humbly open my life. Then when I receive it, watch what's going on here. Now I'm, I'm, a, I'm, like, I'm welcoming it into my life. I'm embracing it. So it starts with a humble openness, but then I'm receiving, I'm, I'm welcoming the word into my life. You see the difference? They're, they're similar, but you can be humble and open, then hear a word or hear a sermon that offends you, and instead of receiving it, embracing it, welcoming it, you go like this. I'm open to you, God. Oh, not that. <laughs> and you move to this motion. I, I, I was open until you said that, until, you know, that, that phrase or until you preached about that. This is welcoming and receiving. Uh, back in, in uh, the summer, in August, uh, Pastor John Jacobs from our Vermilion campus preached uh, on uh, Acts 28.30. And he, it was this I, the idea there that Paul was in jail but welcoming people into the house arrest. And he opened his arms, he opened his life and welcomed them John didn't use these arm motions, I don't think, but, but this is the idea. It's, and it's, this, again, the same word in the Greek. It's he welcomed them, dekomai, into his life, into the, the house arrest that he was in. And then John applied that idea of being open to welcoming the word. And he used this line. It's so good, John. Hey, thanks, John. So good that I'm gonna put it up here. What we welcome in our life is what changes our life. Good job, John. But welcome, what we welcome in our life. So I want, to, I want to invite you to welcome the word, embrace it into your life, receive it, and we'll talk about what that looks like in the next couple of verses because this is the early steps of receiving the word of God so that it, it changes your life. Now remember, we're still in this second soil, the rocky soil, and you're like, Jim, man, you're making the rocky soil sound good. I know, because it is good at first. Let's go back to this verse. Verse 13. Those who are on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy. This is good. Great start. When they hear it, but they have no root, they believe for a while. Oh, my goodness. But it looks like they stop believing. This is such a good start. And again, these two phrases are what, you, what I want you to see. Receiving the word, that's this welcoming, that's this embracing into my life. Believing is the next thing for you to understand when it comes to how do I receive the word of God? How do I welcome it into my life? How do I embrace it? I believe it. And of course, believing is not just something that happens in my head. It's also not just something that happens in my heart. But what I believe in my head, what I believe in my heart, shows up in what I say, right? And how I live. That's how we know what you really believe. Not what you say, but what you do. Not how you, you know, talk about the faith, but whether you live out the Christian life. So this, these people are doing it right. They're receiving the word with joy. They're believing for a while. And this believing is so important to the the, the hearing the word of God so that it changes our life, so it transforms us, so we produce a harvest in our life, which is what we all want. And let me stop, just help you see how this welcoming the word, believing the word, fits with our discipleship process. We talk about how, how important, no, no, how essential it is for us, if we're gonna grow as disciples, to devote ourselves to the word of God. So different kind of language, devote, but the same idea, when I hear the word, I'm embracing it. I'm opening my life to it, and I'm embracing, I'm welcoming it. I'm, I'm eagerly accepting. There's this joy this, as I come to the word of God, as I come to church, as I come to a time of devotions. There's an eagerness to hear and accept and embrace and welcome this into my life, and then to believe it because those are the things that bring about change. Again, so far, so good, but watch here. This, these phrases here that talk about receiving the word and believing for a while are both followed by the word but. And so these, can I say this? These buts go together <laughs> and they help connect the idea of receiving the word and believing for a while 
but they also connect what comes after. But they have no root. That's connected with the second but in the time of testing. In other words, what Jesus is used, doing in his parable is he's saying that like, the reason why the roots don't go down is because of this time of testing. This is where everything begins to change for this second group of people, the second kind of hearts. They look so good. They start off so well. And in the church, we're like, hey, way to go. You know, you just came to Christ, and now you're growing. This is so good. But then a time of testing comes. And so it's time for us, we've taken a deeper look at spiritual growth. We've taken a deeper look at receiving the word. It's time for us to take a deeper look at these times of testing. And the key thing here is that when testing, when times of testing come in your life, they do one of two things. They either deepen the roots of your faith, the time of testing, like winds blowing against a plant or a tree drives the roots down deeper. Um, times of testing, adversity can deepen the roots or times of testing can expose the reality that you have a shallow heart. You may have thought, hey, I'm doing so well. I'm receiving the word with joy. There's an eagerness. There's an acceptance. I'm humble. This is going so well. Then testing comes and all of a sudden you fall apart. And what that reveals is that your roots did not go deep. And what, in fact, you have is a shallow heart. Now, let's pause here for a moment and talk about this picture of shallowness. Because what Jesus is painting here is a picture of a field that has hard ground on the path, last week's sermon. And now, parts of the field where the, 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 the soil which is a picture of the heart, is, you know, I don't know how many inches, but it's, it's not deep, it's shallow. So when the sun shines, that's the words that Matthew and Mark use, when the sun shines or when adversity comes, when times of testing come, it, the, the fact that the soil is so shallow, the roots can't go down into that. And we'll talk about why that is in just a second. But let me get real, or, you know, real um, clear about what do I mean by times of testing? You've got your notes there. You can see there's three lines. The first thing that times of testing are, are usually just times of difficulty. This, this could be anything, times of difficulty in your marriage, times of difficulty in a, a relationship with somebody who's important to you, uh, times of difficulty in your job. Uh, these are times of difficulty with your finances. Maybe you can't get a job. Times of difficulty at school. <clears throat> this, there's really, literally hundreds and hundreds of things that could be times of difficulty in your life, times of difficulty with your health. Any kind of difficulty sets us into a time of testing. And this time of testing, this, this time of difficulty, often, not always, but often brings times of pain. And the, the, the more pain you have, the more relational pain, your marriage is falling apart. And at first, it's like, wow, things are kind of rough here. Then you begin to realize, oh my gosh, we, we don't have anything in common, or we've been doing our own thing, or we've been ignoring each other, and you go through a time of testing, and it, it, it trashes your marriage. And actually, it's not the time of testing that trashed your marriage. The time of testing revealed the shallowness of your marriage. See, most marriages, most people wait until times of testing before they work on their marriage. And usually, or oftentimes, it's, it's almost too late because if it's so far in, people have already kind of gotten their corners. You know, I, I got my position. I got your, you know, you got your position. I know how you are. You know how I am. And we're just kind of get in the corners and then we just fight. We argue and we point and we blame and all that. And so it kind of reveals that you really don't have a very strong marriage or, or the times of pain in our financial lives. Sometimes this causes people to go, well, man, I need to wake up and make some changes in the way I, I, mean, I need to start a budget. I need to go to Financial Peace University. I, I need to change the way I'm spending my money or whatever. It's pain in relationships, in life, in jobs, in money. It's pain that often gets our attention, right? What did C.S. Lewis say? That pain is God's megaphone to get our attention. I mean, he's, he's speaking to us. He's whispering to us. 
He maybe is raising his voice, trying to get our attention, and we're ignoring him. We're doing our own thing. We're just kind of living our own life. And then God loves us so much that sometimes he grabs the megaphone called pain and he shouts into our life, I love you too much to let you go down that path any farther. And so I allow, not always bring, but mostly allow pain to happen to try to wake you up to see you're going down the wrong path. Remember that proverb that shows up twice in the book of Proverbs? There's a way that seems right to a person, but the end is death. That's what this megaphone of of pain is intended to, to help us see. Times of difficulty are times of testing. Times of pain and suffering are times of testing. And don't ever believe anyone who tells you that suffering means you're not walking with God. It might just be that suffering in your life is the sign that God wants to take you deeper, either to repent of the sin that's been creeping up in your life or to change the directions that you started to go or to open you up to some new things that he wants to do in your life. Suffering is one of God's most effective tools to help us grow to become more like Christ. I didn't think I'd get an amen there. Let me try you again. Suffering, this is your chance. Suffering is one of God's most effective tools to help us grow to become more like Christ. Okay, that's a little better. And maybe you didn't say amen because you're not sure you understand that yet. I'm not sure I believe that. But those of you who said amen, you probably are going, oh, yeah, I can remember how God's used suffering. Again, it's not just because I've wandered. It's sometimes it's just a, it's a part. It's it's what Jesus had to go through. It's a part of what it means to grow. So pay attention in times of suffering, times of testing. And that's the next thing I want you to hear is that the third kind of testing is literally the times of temptation. It's fascinating to me that in the Greek, the word for test and the word for temptation are the same word. Every temptation is a test. What what do you mean? Every temptation is a test. Will you trust God or will you trust yourself? It's a test. Will you pursue God or will you pursue your own path? Will you repent or will you continue in your sin? Every test draws out what's there. Every test is an opportunity for you to trust God. So next time you're tempted, and there will be another time, recognize this temptation is a test. It's an opportunity for me to trust God in the temptation, to trust God in the test. And as you trust him in the temptation, you get stronger and stronger. Without the temptation, without the test, you never get strong spiritually. Again, even Jesus was tempted. It's a part of the process of becoming like Christ. And you say, well, how do I know in the Greek, because you're all translating the Greek, how do I know whether that translated temptation or test? The context will help you see. You'll recognize, oh, this is, this, we should use the word temptation here, or we should use the word tempt, like when Jesus was in the wilderness. Satan was tempting him, but he was also testing him. So not every test is a temptation, track with me. Not every test is a temptation, but every temptation is a test. I'm not trying to be cute, just trying to parse, the, if you help you understand there. So when a time of testing comes, just step back, say, okay, God, Instead of saying, why are you doing this? Or why are you allowing this? Say, God, what? What are you you trying to teach me here? What are you trying to do in me? I'm going through this time of difficulty, this time of pain and suffering, this time of temptation for a reason, because you're in charge of my life. You're sovereign over my life. So what is it, God? What do you want me to see? What do you want me to hear? What are you exposing in my heart? Yes. That's where we need to go next. We need to take a deeper look at our heart because that's what's going on with the time of testing. And Jesus says that's what made the difference. It either deepens the roots of our faith or in this story, it exposed the shallowness of their heart. Let's talk about our hearts. Let's take a deeper look into our hearts, especially this second kind of soil, this second kind of heart that Jesus is talking about, the shallow, the, the heart that doesn't have depth of soil. 
It's the, it's the rocky heart. It's the heart that eventually becomes dry. And I, I want to just lay out, I, I actually could do like 20 or 30 of these, but I only, I'm going to run out of room. As we look at this story and as we look at other scriptures, uh, I can pull together some symptoms of a shallow heart. And my prayer with the prayer team this morning, and now I'm just praying right now, is that God will show each one of us here, do I have a shallow heart? And here are some of the symptoms. The first one I'll put up is shallow understanding. Um, I don't really read the Bible a whole lot. I hear it preached once in a while, but I have a, I know a little bit about the Bible, but I don't know that much. I have a shallow understanding of God, of the Bible, of the things of God. Theology is a bad word for me because that's just for, you know, people who want to nerd out. You know, I, why do people spend so much time studying the Bible? It's just not that important. Oh, oh it is essential that each of us who are disciples become students of the word. And there's a time for us to go deeper and to deepen our understanding of who is God? What is he saying? So if you were here last week, we handed out some excursion guides. We handed out you know, a bunch of excursion guides to help you go with a, other people into a life group through this excursion, uh, through this excursion guide. And so we, we, if you weren't here last week, get one today. And they're off by weeks. And so the one for this week um, it has a section in it called Know Your Beliefs. It's a little survey that you can take real quickly, and please don't do it right now, even though it won't take you long. We're almost done. Um, go to that survey, click on it, and based upon your answers, it'll help you see, wow, I don't know the Bible as well as I thought I did. That's good to know, because clarity is a good thing, right? Clarity is kindness. Now that I'm clear, I know what I should do next. And so, I'd love for all of you to take that survey. It's really quick because there is an epidemic, a pandemic happening in our country that's been going for such a long time. It's called biblical illiteracy. It's not just our culture because it's true about our culture, but it's terrifyingly more and more true about the church of Jesus Christ. People don't know their Bibles. And if you don't know your Bible, then you automatically will have a shallow understanding of your faith. You'll automatically have a shallow understanding of who God is and what's he doing and what does the Bible say about him? So this, this is not meant to make you look bad, this taking this test. It's to, it's to expose, it's to reveal to you, oh, I need to go deeper in my faith. I need to take a class. I need to be in a Bible study. I, I need to study the word. I need to read a book. I need to go deeper in my understanding of who God is, what the Bible says, what the Bible is all about. And that's a, it's an important step that every Christian, not just a few, every Christian must take if we want to be more and more like Jesus, a deeper understanding. But here's another symptom that's, that's sometimes, oddly enough, the, can be the, almost the opposite. And I'll explain what I mean by that. And that is the person who's got all kinds of understanding, but they're not doing anything about it. There's a lack of obedience. And we've heard me say for 21 years, if, if you've been around here as long as I've been around, I've said this a billion times. Knowledge doesn't save you. And knowing things isn't enough. You've got to put them into practice. You've got to live it out. You've got to do the word. And so in our excursion guide, we help you do the word every week because we understand that obedience is absolutely essential. Again, not important. Essential for disciples of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. And what I sometimes see is that people catch the vision. Oh, I get it. We're supposed to obey. And they think the Christian life is just about obedience. And they never study. They never go deep. They, they kind of like turn off with understanding and just it's all about obedience. Those are extremes. We want to hold these together in intention. I want to keep going deeper in the word, but I also want to keep living it out. I don't, I don't ignore either one of those. So when you hear somebody say, you know, understanding, studying, going deeper, that's not important. That's not a biblical truth. You hear somebody say, well, obedience is not that important. As long as you know it, that's not a biblical truth. You got to hold these two together. And this are, these are symptoms. And sometimes they're two different symptoms. Sometimes they're in the same person 
These are symptoms of a shallow, rocky, dry heart. Let's keep going. Typically, when you live long enough with a shallow understanding of God, your love for God will start to cool. Or when you live very long with disobeying God, either because you're flat out disobeying him or because you're not doing what you should do, disobedience, your lack of obedience in your life will eventually create a, a lack of hunger because you'll begin to realize in the back of your mind, I should be doing this. And that should be turns into kind of a, a guilt that begins to just rack your brain. And all you need to do is just obey God, but you won't because you're rebellious and you resist. And so you just keep living in that. And pretty soon your heart for God your love for God, your hunger for God, your hunger for God's word begins to wane. This is happening in some of your lives. You, didn't, you, know, you don't have that first love, that passion for God that you used to have. And that either leads us to or is a result also of flirting with sin or being bound by a sin that you just can't beat. You're an addict to that sin. You're captive to that sin. And that makes sense because you don't want to understand how, how, how insidious sin is because you have a shallow understanding. You think sin is a small thing. Or you don't understand the importance of obedience and you've lost your hunger for God. So sin is having its free reign in your life. These are the symptoms of a shallow, rocky, dry heart. Or there's this reluctance to surrender. You, you hear a sermon like this and you, you know... You should confess that sin. You know you need to get back in the word. You know you need to obey God, but you won't do it. You won't, res- you won't re- you're just kind of this resistance in your life. You're resistant to surrender. Instead of opening your life and being humble and receiving what God has to say, you're resisting God. This is a symptom of a shallow, rocky heart. Now I've got two more. This is one of the ones that's maybe the ones that is the most difficult to to deal with, our unwillingness to forgive, our unwillingness to let go of a hurt or a, a wound that happened in a relationship. And maybe it's something that you did or maybe it's something that was done to you. And maybe it was recently, maybe it was a long time ago, but you... You're just not willing to go there. And so you, you resist. You, you won't read the, God, the word of God. You, you won't open up what the Bible has to say. You're, you're resistant when you hear sermons that talk about forgiveness and how important it is. And you're like, oh, here we go again. And you wall up. You won't do it. Somebody just says something real simple to you. You ought to forgive that person. You're like, you don't know what they did to me. And you've got all kinds of reasons for why you should forgive. And your heart's getting harder and harder and harder. And that soil in your heart is getting shallower and shallower. So let, let me, let me I pause because things are really heavy now and take you back to my story with my friend Randy. He says, Jim, it's, it's time we take a deeper look. And I'm like, okay, that sounds great. Let's do that. What do we need to do? He goes and gets a shovel out of his truck. He goes, we're going to dig up your yard. I'm like, no, no, no. I have spent a lot of money on this yard. Let's not dig it up. He goes, I'm not going to dig up the whole yard, just these patch areas. I'm like, Randy, isn't there some other way? He goes, there is no other way. Listen to that. There is no other way. We got to dig up those areas. I'm like, okay, I'm trusting you. You're the lawn guy. You know, you do this for a living. So he starts digging in my lawn, right in the patch areas. They're nasty and ratty. And I couldn't believe the things he found in my yard. In fact, I have some of them right here. This is vinyl siding. It was in my yard. Like, this, not this particular one. I ripped this off my house, or actually, it's a piece, it's a piece I had around. But I had strips of vinyl siding. I'm like, what is that doing in my yard? And then I found bunches of pieces of wood, just lumber, two by fours, plywood, all this stuff in my yard. And of course, there's all kinds of rocks in the, in the yard. I, I've gotten rid of the gravel, but I didn't realize there was rocks. But the thing that blew me away the most, this is a blob of cement. And 
you know, I, got, I, did, I haven't saved this from my house in Kansas. It's, a, it's not like it's a trophy. Um, actually, I dug this out of my backyard last night. Because as I was thinking about this sermon and preaching, I and remembering this blob of cement. But what had happened was that a um, cement truck who either was pouring sidewalk or pouring uh, driveway dumped the, the end of his run into the yard and then just covered up with soil. Now, Randy had seen this before. I'd never heard of this. I was like, what the heck? Or maybe I was even more upset about it than that. But as I was thinking about this, I, I remembered that 21 years ago when I moved to this house, I saw this this cropping of cement in my backyard, way in the very back of the yard, and I've left it there for 21 years. And I thought, I'm going to dig that up. So I dug it up last night in the rain. And it was, it was so big, I had to, I had to pick it, pickaxe it in half because it was like this big, and I'm not strong enough to, to carry that big of a piece of cement blob. But here is a picture, or here is a piece of the blob that was in my backyard here in Ohio it was just like, this is, this is not rock, this is gravel and cement. This was what is in my yard with all this other wood and rocks and vinyl siding and all this junk was buried in my yard. And the, the soil that they put over top of it was only like this deep. And sure enough, the roots couldn't go down. They were hitting plywood. They were hitting two by fours. They were hitting cement blobs and vinyl siding. And suddenly, when I began to think about this, I realized that's what Jesus is talking about. There are, tr- there's trash in our hearts that's blocking the roots from being able to go down into our hearts. Probably the one has vinyl siding in their heart. If you do, then you need to go someplace besides church. <clears throat> but the, the, the rocks, the gravel, the two by fours, the plywood, the the blobs of cement, there are metaphors for the rocks in our heart, which are areas of resistance, which are areas of hurt that we wouldn't deal with. And we thought we could just bury it, throw soil over top of it, throw good works over top of it, even good soil, dump good soil on top of the rocks and no one will see it. And this is what we do with sin in our life. This is what we do with hurts in our life. We think we can bury them by good works or bury them by going to church or bury them by just kind of ignoring them and they'll go away. And it's, it's, it blocks off, it suffocates the roots of the plants that God you know, wants to grow in our life, the spiritual growth, and it, it just can't get past that. And so these symptoms all reveal this kind of thing going in our life. And that, that usually produces kind of a sporadic commitment. And again, I could have talked about a lot more things than that. But here's the terrifying thing for me, which is the next thing for you to write down, is that a shallow heart eventually becomes a dry heart, which eventually becomes a hard heart. Why is it dry? Because Jesus said the moisture can't, um, penetrate. The, the, there's just not enough soil there that's deep enough that can hold the moisture, and so the sun beats down and dries it out. This is such a graphic picture of our hearts. It's very important this morning that if there are any of these unforgiveness issues, hurts, wounds, sins that you haven't repented of, there are rocks and trash in your heart, that you deal with it, that you 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 deal with the rocks before they dry out your heart and you end up with a hard heart. Remember last week's sermon? When your heart is hard, hard, the seed of the word of God lands on that heart like a seed landing on cement and it just bounces off. The hard heart is the dangerous place to be. But so is a, a rocky, stony, shallow heart because you're just one or a series of steps away from a hard heart. So let's wrap this up by talking about some solutions. What do I do about, and I've already kind of said some things, but first of all, let's remove the rocks, okay? So let's deal with the past hurts. If if the rocks are there because you've been hurt or because something has happened that, that disappointed you so deeply that it became something you held on to, somebody sinned against you, somebody hurt you, whether they did it on purpose or not, 
You got to deal with those rocks. You got to deal with those hurts. Uh, Years ago, I preached a sermon series called uh, How to Handle Your Hurts. And I couldn't believe how many people bought up that series because they they didn't know how to handle the hurts in their life. And today, all these years later, I'm thinking about preaching it again because I keep seeing people's lives being sabotaged by refusing to deal with the hurts in their life, the unforgiveness, the pain. And whether it's something that just happened recently or whether like this rock here, it's been buried in your heart for 21 years. That's why why I dug it up because I was like, oh, Jim, this has been in your backyard for 21 years. Has there anything been in your heart for 21 years? God, show me, reveal the rock so I can remove them, amen? Or maybe it's that you need to repent of that unconfessed sin. That will absolutely squeeze the life of God out of your heart. It'll dry your heart out. It'll create toxic waste all by itself. Sin is destructive. Sin is not neutral. Sin is not something, well, it's just, it's just you know, kind of a bad thing for a while. No, it's like a toxic waste in your heart and it destroys you from the inside out. Deal with your sin. Deal with your unconfessed sin. How do I do that? Confess it. John says, if we will confess our sins, God is faithful and his justice comes out. He is faithful and just, and he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness because God, the holy God, the just God, wants to dwell with us in intimacy, and he can't do that when our sins are blocking the intimacy. The holy God can't have an intimate communion with a person whose life is full of unconfessed sin. But all you have to do, it's so simple, all you have to do is repent of that sin and that blocks are taken away. The rocks are gone. The wood is gone. Instantly, that's how, that's the beauty of sincere repentance is as soon as you do it, there's no you know, um, school you have to go to, no penance you have to do. Just repent of your sin and God will wipe it out and make you clean. Amen? So repent of those things. Or maybe it's time for you to deepen the soil, you know, get that understanding. And that... Deepening the soil, it starts with the act of surrender. I'm surrendering to God, right? But I'm also surrendering to God's growth process in my life. I'm beginning to understand how God uses times of suffering, how God uses times of testing. I begin to understand how important it is for me to deal with my sin. I'm beginning to understand how my heart is shallow and I gotta dig into those rocks. I'm beginning to understand how growth works and so I'm just gonna surrender my life. This is a great place to start. Just surrender my life to God and open myself up to him and say to him, you know what, God, I I do have a rocky heart. I do have rocks that are underneath the surface. Just like in Israel, where there's rocks and limestone that's like a substrata under the soil, you can't see it. It looks like the soil is good, but it's only so, so deep. So there is substrata rock under some of our lives and it's never going to produce a harvest until we dig that out. And that starts with surrender, amen? Starts with surrendering my life to him. And so verse six talks about how they withered because they had no moisture. So the third thing I would suggest in terms of removing the rocks, repenting and deepening soil is water the plants. <laughs> and I'm, re- I'm reminded of Romans chapter five, verse five, where Paul says that God's love has been poured out. That's, that's, that's the water picture. Has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So God's love. So watering the plants is to soak in God's love. Just let the, let the love of God just pour over your life. See, Paul says that God's kindness, which is a picture of God's love, leads us to repentance. So soak in God's love. See how much he loves you. Soak in that. Maybe you don't need to repent of sin. Maybe you just need to just soak in God's love. Just You're running so fast, you don't know what it's like to, to be with him and allow him to love on you because this is what God loves to do. But don't just kind of do it abstractly. Soak in God's love as you soak in God's word, okay? Well, there it is. So there's a couple scriptures that you can use. And take a picture of that, all right? So I'll get out of the way. Take a picture of that. Maybe we'll put that online or in social media somewhere. These are scriptures that talk about how God loves us. There'll be great verses to meditate on. I guess I'm out of the camera now, sorry. Um, Just soak in these. 
This is soaking in God's love, which is soaking in God's word. And let the truth of God's word expose those rocks. Let the truth of God's love melt away the ice, dig away the rocks and the garbage in there, and deepen that soil so that when the seed lands, it produces a harvest, amen? It's, it's deep and fruitful and beautiful. So it starts with me just giving my heart to God, this idea of surrender. Lord, I give you my heart. I, I give you my life. I just surrender myself. This is, we, 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 uh, we have a song that we love to sing that it just gives us a picture of this. And I'd love for all of us to close our eyes and we're gonna stand and sing this song in a second. But bef before we do, with our eyes closed, I wanna just take you back one more time to my story in my yard. I dug up the rocks. I dug up the two by fours. I dug up the plywood and I put in new soil and I reseeded it and it flourished. And this is a picture of what God wants to do with you today. He wants you to dig up the rocks. He'll help you dig them up. Just surrender. Just surrender to him. Lord, here's my heart. I give you my heart. I give you my life. And as you do, he'll help you dig those things out. And then we'll replace it with good soil. And the seed will come and it'll flourish. And you'll begin to have a healthy, flourishing spiritual life. You'll become more and more like Jesus. And you'll you'll have a life that honors him and that pleases him. Your life will be good and deep and flourishing. Lord, this is what I pray for people. And so we just stand to our feet. Let's all stand to our feet and we just offer ourselves to you. We surrender our lives to you. Lord, here's my heart. Here's my life. There's a line in here that, that says, Lord, have your way with me. So, Lord, we pray that you will have your way with us today, that you'll open us up, that you'll do your work in us. And whatever it is you want to do today, we say yes, Lord. Sin you want to point out, rocks you want to dig up, areas of resistance, hurts, wounds, whatever it is, God, have your way with us. Surrender to you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.